So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello there, this is Robin Norgren and I'm your host for Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on Instagram on my links under Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for life. I'd like to start first with Walking on Water by Madeline Lango. I finally discovered a way to make the point that writing is writing, whether the story is for the chronologically young or old. I give whatever group I am teaching two assignments. The first is to write an incident from their childhood or adolescence, which was important to them. Write in the first person, nothing cosmic, just an incident. And do not write this for children. Repeat, do not write this for children. Write it for yourselves. Write it for each other. When I am giving this assignment as part of a juvenile's workshop at a writer's conference, I will already have read the stories and chapters of books which the conferences have submitted. Thus far, in every case, the work they hand in for their assignments is better than the stories they wrote for children. I repeat, do not write this for children. You write for yourselves. Do you understand how much better this work is than the story you submitted when you were writing for children? The second assignment follows. Rewrite this story, this time in the third person and from the point of view of someone else. This is a useful assignment for writing, the beginning, for, for teaching the beginning writer point of view, and it is not always easy. Often I get wails of, but I can't. One 11th grader in the class of techniques of fiction I teach at St. Hilda's and St. Hugh's School in New York wrote a story of her move from the country to the city to Harlem when she was seven or eight years old. She was frightened by the tall buildings, the crowded streets, the constant noise of taxi horns and shouting and sirens. So she would escape to the park where she found an old tree which had branches on onto which she would climb. The tree became her friend, her confidant, her solace. At the end of the summer, the tree was struck by lightning and felled. She had lost her best friend. The tree and the child were the only characters in the story. When I gave the second assignment, that was the expected. And then there was the expected, I can't. I gave her no hints. You can use your imagination. Her second story, written from the point of view of the tree, was much better than the first. And the class was delighted and everyone had a glimpse of what imagination can do. A Catholic priest at the, at the Baptist, a Green Lakes Writers' Conference in Wisconsin, wrote a story about a man, a fly, and God. We switched the point of view to God in the second assignment and realized this was a mistake. It would have been better for him to have tried from the point of view of the fly. I can't take credit for these assignments, They were given me by Leonard Elrich in the one creative writing class we were allowed in college. After graduation, when I went to New York and started selling the stories I had written during my four years at Smith around various magazines, the result of this second assignment was was one of the first to be sold. From these assignments, I will learn everything I need to know about the student's strengths and weaknesses in writing fiction and we'll have a good idea of where to go next in teaching techniques. I also learn a great deal about the students, which can in itself be helpful. So I gave these two assignments my first two days at Anya Napa. Many of the 11th and 12th grade 
graders I teach at New York have had hard lives, come from broken families, have learned too early about anger and death and despair. But I had never read anything like the first assignments I had from the young men and women at, at Ayaya Napa. Edith is married to a Kenyan and is becoming African, but she was born in the U.S. and schooled in, the, in an affluent suburb. One day, the science teacher at her high school came to talk to the students about evolution. I can prove we came from monkeys, he said. Look at her, and he pointed at Edith. Edith's sec second story, which she wrote from the point of view of the science teacher, was a lesson to me in Christian compassion. The teacher is forgiven, wholly forgiven, because she can experience, she can look at that experience without feeling the hurt all over again. Joseph from Papua New Guinea wrote about his father's experience as a cook in the Australian Army when Joseph was a child. One evening there were 50 extra men and Joseph's father had not been told they were coming and he didn't have enough food. So he was beaten by the Australians and then burning water was poured over him. The message of Joseph's story was love. It had not been easy for him to learn not to hate Australians, but he had learned. He is married to an Australian and they have a charming baby. He has taken hate and turned it to love. And perhaps that is the essential ingredient of Christian children's books, or any Christian book, the message of love. A Christian children's book must have, ultimately, affirm an affirmative view of life. So a children's book must be, first and foremost, a good book, a book with a young protagonist with whom the reader can identify, and a book which says yes to life. Granted, a number of young adult books have been published with a negative view of life, just as with anti-heroes. Again, from all I hear from librarians and teachers, they, need, they may be read once, but they are not returned to. Not long ago, a college senior asked if she could talk to me about being a Christian writer. If she wanted to write Christian fiction, how was she going to go about it? I told her that if she was truly and deeply a Christian, what she writes is going to be Christian, whether she mentions Jesus or not. And if she is not, in the most profound sense, Christian, then what she writes is not going to be Christian, no matter how many times she invokes the name of the Lord. From Daniel Laporte's book, The White Hot Truth, Secretly Not Nice. You're bright. You know who you are. And you're committed to knowing more. You're becoming more successful all the time. And you're smart enough to know that success is a relative term. You're a generally stable, confident, compassionate citizen. You practice mindful speech. You send light to the people who piss you off. You get regular massage treatments. And yet, you kind of hate yourself. You'd never say it out loud, but just a little bit. Somewhere in there, there's some certifiable self-loathing. I used to think that my self-criticism was part of being self-aware and self-referencing, an essential component of having a moral conscience. I preferred to call it critiquing. I thought that pushing myself hard to be a better person was a spiritual responsibility. I assumed that this because of all the Virgo I had in my chart. Five planets in Virgo, in fact. My sun sign is Gemini, which explains why I'm such a superlative and modest communicator. But my non-Virgo New Age friends were just as hard on themselves. This was never more apparent than with their daily tasks. As many women will attest the greatest, most monumental trigger of self-criticism in the history of ladykind is our fucking to-do lists. Contemporary women reveal, revere their lists like Moses loved his stone tablets. They are directions to the promised land, the thrill of crossing something off. Check, check, and check. Hmm, feels so good. 
so good that you might write stuff down that you've already done just so you can cross it off. Yep, you got it bad. Like any addiction, the to-do list is destined to lose its thrill when it rules us. I looked at my listus maximus and thought, with all this psychotherapy and Reiki and yoga, I barely have time for myself. Snort. My list started feeling like a row of soldiers shouting at me. I decided to track it for two days to take a candid inventory of everything my to-do list was really saying to me. Once I started paying attention, that background noise became awfully loud. It's refrain, refrain on repeat. I sort of suck because I should. Go to yoga more, not watch YouTube videos of baby pandas and prince interviews while I'm writing about subjects of great import. Be more informed about world politics. Meditate every day and for much longer. Be more loving, be more judgment, less judgmental and confrontational about crap customer service. Lose 10 pounds, really 15. Do so by eating more protein and not meat. But if I have to eat meat, make sure it's free range and local. But I'd rather not eat meat, but then where am I going to get easy protein? Be more loving, be more grateful. Show more gratitude to everyone in the whole world. Send thank you cards to the readers who send gifts. Make sure they're handwritten and sent within a week. Be more inclined to socialize. Be less critical of all the bad New Age websites with Cosmic Sans typeface. Be more loving. Forgive her for not forgiving me. Be more loving. Pay more attention to my kid. Is he getting too much screen time? I should really be more loving. Not so loving, is it? It's a hot pile of loathsome, shitty shoulds underneath a lot of halo polishing. That's what it is. As seasoned soul seekers, the necessity of healthy self-esteem is in our awareness, and yet, hating yourself? Could there be a heavier, shame-soaked, cringe-inducing concept? Hatred. Hate of self. You hating you? How could you think of yourself this way? In 1990, there was a small gathering of psychologists, scientists, and meditators who came together with the Dalai Lama to explore the topic of healing emotions. Sharon Salzberg was there. She's a much-adored writer on loving kindness and happiness and the co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in the U.S. Their poignant interaction at the meeting is now legendary. She asked him, Your Holiness... What do you think about self-hatred? Apparently, His Holiness looked startled, leaned over to his translator, and emphatically and repeatedly asked for a translation of self-hatred. Finally, he looked back to Sharon and asked, Self-hatred, what is that? Hold up. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who is considered to be the incarnation of the Bodhisattva of Compassion, didn't get the concept of self-loathing, something that so many of us Westerners know all too well. You know, down on yourself, man. We live this way. When I first heard about this event, I thought, doesn't everyone hate themselves to some degree? Like, isn't that a universal human affliction? Apparently not. Also present at that meeting of great minds was meditation teacher and author Jack Cornfield, who adds to the story. Then, the Dalai Lama asks not only whether we know what Sharon was talking about, but also if we ourselves experience this self-hatred. And almost all the Buddhist teachers there, representing an entire generation, said, Yes. With his hallmark humility, the Dalai Lama responded, I thought I had a very good acquaintance with the mind, but now I feel quite ignorant. I find this very, very strange. Some philosophical discussions of this story bring up the point that while it would be hard to say that Tibetan Buddhists and the Dalai Lama have literally never heard of self-hatred or self-aggression, it's simply not emphasized in their spirituality in the way that it is in the Western world. Maybe this is because they didn't grow up with the original Sin soundtrack playing in the background of their lives. Thrown for a loop, His Holiness wanted to explore the concept of self-hatred further. 
he was not letting it go. Is that some kind of nervous disorder, he asked? Are people like that very violent? And then he delivered this white-hot truth in the form of a question. But you have Buddhist nature. How could you think of yourself that way? Stephen Pressfield, in his book, The War of Art, talking about resistance. Resistance and criticism. If you find yourself criticizing other people, you're probably doing it out of resistance. When we see others beginning to live their authentic selves, it drives us crazy if we have not lived out our own. Individuals who are realized in their own lives almost never criticize others. If they speak at all, it is to offer encouragement. Watch yourself. Of all the manifestations of resistance, most only harm ourselves. Criticism and cruelty harms others as well. Resistance and self-doubt. Self-doubt can be an ally. This is because it serves as an indicator of aspiration. It reflects love love of something we dream of doing, and desire, desire to do it. If you find yourself asking yourself and your friends, am I really a writer? Am I really an artist? Chances are you are. The counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. Resistance and fear. Are you paralyzed with fear? That's a good sign. Fear is good, like self-doubt. Fear is an indicator. Fear tells us what we have to do. Remember our rule of thumb. The more scared we are of a work or calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. Resistance is experienced as fear. The, de fear, the degree of fear equates to the strength of resistance. Therefore, the more fear we feel about a specific enterprise, the more certain we can be that the enterprise is important to us and to the growth of our soul. That's why we feel so much resistance. If it meant nothing to us, there'd be no resistance. Have you ever watched Inside the Actor Studio? The host, James Lipton, invariably asks his guests, What factors make you decide to take a particular role? The actor always answers, because I'm afraid of it. The professional tackles the project that will make him stretch. He takes on the assignment that will bear him into uncharted waters, compel him to explore unconscious parts of himself. Is he scared? Hell yes, he's petrified. Conversely, the professional turns down roles he's done before. He's not afraid of that anymore. Why waste his time? So if you're paralyzed with fear, it's a good sign. It shows what you have to do.